El tema que nos convoca es Sistemas de Producción Sustentables, una conferencia plenaria a cargo de Dwayne Beck y va a ser moderada por Diego Cosentino. Les pedimos a los disertantes que por favor vayan subiendo al estrado. Les voy presentando al moderador, a Diego Cosentino, quien es ingeniero agrónomo, egresado de la Facultad de Agronomía de la Universidad de Buenos Aires en 1990. Tiene un magíster en en Ciencias del Suelo, también de la Facultad de Agronomía, obtenido en el año 2000. Y también posee un doctorado en Ciencias del Suelo en el INAP de París en 2006. Y por último, digamos que es investigador y consultor en la Facultad de Agronomía de la Universidad de Buenos Aires y del CONICET, y también investigador en Ciencias del Suelo y presidente de la Asociación Argentina de la Ciencia del Suelo. Queda con ustedes Diego Cosentino, quien va a presentar al disertante de, esta, de este bloque, Dwayne Beck, quien va a hablar sobre sistemas de producción sustentables. Diego, adelante, por favor. Gracias, muy amable. Bueno, buenas tardes a todos, gracias por venir. El importante aquí es el doctor Dwayne Beck, que está a mi lado. Dwayne es profesor del Departamento de Ciencias de la Universidad de South Dakota. Él, aparte de trabajar en la universidad, gerencia el campo experimental Dakota Lakes. Este campo es, eh, es propiedad de una organización sin fines de lucro que fue creada a fines de los 80 por agricultores familiares y emprendedores. El campo eh, este Dakota Lakes fue manejado usando verdaderas técnicas de agricultura conservacionista, básicamente siembra directa continua y rotaciones, que han tenido mucho éxito. El impacto primario de, de los resultados de Dakota Lakes fue el desarrollo de programas que permitieron una gran proporción de productores del centro de South Dakota adoptar técnicas de agricultura conservacionista siendo, por supuesto, rentables. La identificación del rol extremadamente importante jugado por la rotación de los cultivos para minimizar el perjuicio ocasionado por las malezas, enfermedades e insectos, incrementando la rentabilidad del sistema, fue la contribución clave del éxito del campo experimental de Dakota Lakes. Los principios desarrollados en, en Dakota Lakes fueron exitosamente aplicados a muchos ecosistemas en todo el mundo. El doctor Beck, entonces, forma parte también del Salón de la Fama de la Universidad de South Dakota en el 2007. El doctor Lake nos va a hablar de sistemas de producción sustentables. Hace más de 20 años que la palabra sustentabilidad apenas se comenzaba a escuchar en los ámbitos académicos o científicos. Hacía solo referencia a una idea, a un concepto que parecía intangible o difícil de llevar a la práctica en ese momento. Luego la palabra se fue haciendo cada vez eh, más eh, común y estuvo más a la moda. <coughs> eh, y es una palabra que conjuga el ambiente, lo económico y lo social. ¿no? Agarrada de la mano de la siembra directa, del manejo de las rotaciones y el uso de los ciclos naturales para manejar malezas, pestes e insectos, esta idea parecía acercarse cada vez más a la realidad. Hoy el doctor Wayne viene a mostrarnos que es una idea muy concreta, dándonos una visión integral y filosófica de una producción sustentable. Los dejo con el doctor Dwayne Beck. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to come to Argentina again. I've been here numerous times in the past, and, and some of the people here are, I count as amongst my best friends. If you wonder where uh, we are located, we're about halfway between Minneapolis and, and Denver. We're actually right on the 100th meridian. And in the early days, the people in the United States felt that no crop production could occur on the 100th meridian. Uh, we're three hours from Mount Rushmore, if you ever come and visit, uh, two and a half hours from Sturgis. And what I'm missing this week is a Sturgis motorcycle rally to come, come here, and that's probably a good thing. And we're very <coughs> near where Dances with Wolves was filmed. And, and uh, a lot of people used to remember that movie, but it's getting to be a long time. 
More importantly, I, I think you should look at our native vegetation. It's a mixed grass prairie. We're quite a bit drier than what you are in the humid pampas. We're more similar to some of your southern and western areas uh, uh, where we have mixed, mixed grass prairie. The only place that we would have a tree in, in our ecosystem is where there's extra water coming from uh, off the hillside or something like that through a drainage way. This is an aerial photo of the, the research station that's owned by a group of farmers. Uh, another clue to our native vegetation is to look at the cactus that sometimes grows in our fields. Uh, Dakota Lakes is a unique idea at the time. It's uh, the idea of, of farmer-owned research centers is maybe starting to catch on more now. Uh, it's owned by farmers. It, we have both irrigation and dry land. We make more money by far on the dry land than we do on the irrigation per dollar invested. And we're about as efficient as you can get. One of the problems with irrigation is uh, it takes a lot of energy. It becomes obsolete. It takes a lot of maintenance. You have to continue to, to repair it. So it becomes uh, a fairly high capital cost. Uh, <clears throat> and it's OK to have some, but I wouldn't want to have it all. The, the production enterprise, the money we make on our production enterprise funds a good proportion of the research. My salary is paid by the university. <clears throat> Today I'm not going to get into lots of details because the, the worst thing in the world to, to have happen is to be stuck between you guys in happy hours. So we're going we're gonna to keep it a little bit light today or, or more philosophical. In 1970, the average price of wheat was five cents a kilogram. The average price of a liter of crude oil was two cents. If we look at today, the wheat price is less than 25 cents a kilogram, and the price of a liter of crude oil is more than 67 cents. <clears throat> We're not keeping up. The price of wheat is not increasing as fast as the price of crude oil. And a lot of our systems are based very highly on the use of energy and crude energy. In Minnesota, where tillage is king, it takes slightly under 92 liters of diesel fuel per acre for tillage, seeding, and harvest. We're pretty efficient at burning diesel fuel and getting things done. It takes the energy, though, of 1.7 liters of diesel fuel to manufacture, transport, and apply one kilogram of nitrogen. So if that Minnesota person puts on 150 kilograms of N per hectare, the energy involved is almost three times that used for tillage, seeding, and harvest combined. The big elephant in the room that we sleep with in agriculture, uh, one of them is nitrogen fertilizer. 80% of the total variable input costs in agriculture can be traced directly to the outside energy input, or actually the, the crop inputs and the machinery and whatever take 80 percent of that everything other than land 80 percent can be traced directly to to energy and most of that is fossil fuel 150 years ago when your ancestors came here and mine came to the united states that was essentially zero in a hundred years from now it will probably have to be zero again if, if we continue down the road of trying to turn fossil fuel into food, we'll continue to lose. So we as a board, the farmers and I, made a, a, a plan about five or six years ago that Dakota Lakes Research Farm will be fossil fuel neutral by 2026. Now, that's how we do things there. We, we decide what we're going to do, and then we, we kind of figure out how we're going to do them later. That opens up a whole bunch of questions when you make that kind of statement. This includes producing enough energy to replace all energy associated with production and transportation of the crop. And remember, I irrigate some crop. So we're going to have to offset that energy as well. This will be done without mining the soil of nutrients, without mining the soil of organic matter and productivity or adversely impacting the ecosystem. <clears throat> Accomplishing this goal will require transformational change, not incremental change. 
The last few days I watched a lot of papers and everybody's talking about trying to get this little increment of more yield, this little tiny increment of more yield. When I came to the Dakota Lakes Research Farm, the area of the farmers there produced one crop of wheat every two years because it's dry country and they use tillage to do this. We <clears throat> took them from that system to a system of no-till and diverse rotations. The average wheat crop now, which is growing in a contiguous cropping system with other crops, the average wheat crop now is, is probably closer to four and a half to five tons. This year we had most of the wheat going at six tons or more. And they also produce 10 tons per hectare of corn, and they probably produce uh, three to four tons of soybeans. When they grow soybeans, they grow a lot more sunflower than soybeans. That was a transformational change. That wasn't an incremental change. We didn't try to make them grow wheat a little better. We just totally took them to a different cropping system and a different tillage system. Consequently, they probably increased their profitability by a, a factor of four or five. And they surely increased their productivity in terms of grain by factors in three and four or five. Almost other, all change in agriculture has been incremental up to this time. Almost every research project is an incremental thing. It's not a rethinking and going back to what principles are, but it's been incrementally changing what we started with uh, from our ancestors. Hybrids are an incremental change. Actually, GMOs are an incremental change in a lot of ways. Even no-till, as it is practiced in a lot of areas, is incremental change because rotations haven't changed at all. All that's happened is we've reduce the amount of tillage. <clears throat> this, this project and this different way of approaching problems are just part of a much more complex effort that our producers and you as producers and your children will face in the next several decades. And this has been discussed quite a bit this week, climate change and food insecurity. If we continue to go forward at incremental changes to try to meet some goal, we probably won't make it because population growth is actually geometric, not incremental. Never in history has all mankind knowingly faced a type, this type of impending catastrophe. We face catastrophes, but not all of mankind. Volcanoes and asteroids can impact everyone, but we don't know that they're coming. So we can't really do anything about them at this point in time. Wars and political strife do not impact everyone at the same time. The approach we're talking about being transformational is something like an ecosystem-focused moonshot. And if you're old like I am, you'll remember this. And for all you young people, you should have been there. It was pretty exciting. In the early 1960s, the U.S. had fallen behind in the development of science and technology to the point that the, it threatened the future of the whole country. And we got a new young president, John Kennedy, who acted on this by setting the following goal. By the end of the decade, 1969, we will land a man on the moon and bring him safely back to Earth. Everybody thought he was totally nuts. He didn't say, we're going to build a little bit bigger rocket, one that will go a little faster. And then maybe if we can get that going, then maybe we'll start working on getting a, something that can get to the moon. No, he just sent a challenge out and said, we're going to do this by the end of the decade. Last month, in the United States, we celebrated the 45th anniversary of Apollo 11. And I, <clears throat> I hate to say that I do remember that and I was alive. I'd like to think that I was just a baby, but I wasn't. Uh, we need this same type of focus and resolve, not just by the people in the agricultural economy, but by everyone, including the politicians. Where are the politicians? They should be here. Directed worldwide at the ecosystem and food production system. Everyone eats, not everyone farms, but everyone eats, so these people need to be here. 
So let's say that we put out a challenge by the year 2030, North America, South America, and Europe will all use systems that produce living soils, clean water, healthy and nutritious food, and abundant wildlife, and say that's our goal. We're going to measure outputs, not inputs. We're going to say we are going to produce these things. This goal, if we approach it this way, makes much of the incremental research occurring worldwide irrelevant. We have a lot of tillage comparison studies going on to see if no-till is better than full-till and that maybe we should till now and then. That's all irrelevant if we're going to do the things that I have in those goals those studies don't make any sense. And if they do occur, they should be very limited. <clears throat> We've been doing tillage for long enough. We should know what tillage does. All tillage tools destroy soil structure. All tillage tools decrease water infiltration. All tillage tools reduce organic matter. And all tillage tools increase weeds. In the United States, we have these people selling vertical tillage now. It's just a disc or a set of colders. There's no difference in what we did before. And it does all of these things. It doesn't change that they give it a new name. Nine billion people, it makes no sense for North America, South America, and Europe to degrade our ecosystems in an attempt to feed nine billion people and also try to produce biomass, fuel, and fiber. Because if we do that, number one, these nine billion people can't afford the food. And number two, if they could afford the food, we'd have degraded soils and our descendants would starve to death. We can't afford to be doing silly stuff like this. We need to focus on systems and not details. And unfortunately, science has gotten to the point where it favors details in smaller and smaller specializations instead of bigger and bigger inclusive systems. We need to focus on outputs. What are you creating? What's happening to the water and the air and those kind of things? Not on inputs, not how much we put in. We need to act. We need to act in a, in a manner that we're avoiding problems. We anticipate problems. If, if you're growing soybeans in, on soybeans on soybeans or corn on corn on corn and don't anticipate that you're going to have resistant weed problems, you're just flat stupid. There's no other way to say it. We need to take action and avoid that problem instead of reacting to it once it happens. We need commitment, not involvement. We need to have a lot of people commit things. If you had ham and eggs, almond and huevos, there we go, had almond and huevos this morning. <clears throat> the chicken was involved. The pig was committed. That's the difference. We need to have science and reason, not emotion and rumors. The silliness that we have going about, about food quality and all these things, all these misinformation things, we need to get on top of that. But if you degrade the soil and the water and the air to make a profit, it doesn't count. It flat doesn't count. That's not acceptable. If you take steroids to hit home runs, it doesn't count. And, and we've had evidence now that they've starting to take that approach. So let's look at ecosystem processes, the water cycle, the energy flow, mineral cycle, and community dynamics, these basic ecosystems processes, and judge our, our research and our progress on how we're doing with that. Does the rain feed plants and recharge groundwater, or does it run off or deep percolate and cause erosion and water quality and degradation? <clears throat> we have a big push and places to put in drain tile. All you're doing is taking your nutrients and speeding them to the Gulf of Mexico in the U.S. I got started in no-till with irrigation. 
because the farmers had center pivots that were running water off of the fields. And they wanted to do tillage and whatever. To, they were doing tillage, that's why the water was running, but they wanted to do more tillage to try to stop it. We taught them or learned in, in, in association with them that if we did no-till correctly, we could make water go in the ground. We now put on 50 millimeters of water in nine minutes and have no runoff. And I know there's people in this room that have been there when we've been irrigating, and we walk them right behind the irrigation machines. It's, it's the most interesting thing in the world. And it's because we've developed these soils with these big macro pores and keep the surface covered, and that's the way the native system works. The water goes in the soil where it falls. Are the nutrients on your land available for plant use and environmental services, or have they been leached, eroded, or transported from the landscape to China or to Europe or to the ocean? What's happening to your nutrients? Well, if you're not Balancing your water cycle, your nutrients will turn into saline seeps, and I've been seeing saline seeps here. If you're growing soybeans on soybeans and aren't putting a cover crop in between in the wintertime to use that excess water, you're leaching your nutrients. Your nitrogen is going to the aquifer as well. E ecosystems that leak nutrients eventually turn into deserts. So that's what we're creating when we have all these nutrients leaking unless you can afford to bring them back. One of the problems we have in the world is there's only a limited amount of phosphorus. We ship our soybeans out of South Dakota in railroad trains of 120 cars. And, and each car is, what, 60 tons. <clears throat> that train contains 400,000 kilograms of phosphorus. And it's not coming back unless somebody wants to bring the sewage sludge and the manure from China and bring it back to the United States and spread it on the fields. We're exporting our future. We use cover crops in terms of trying to stop the leakage. We use cover crops to sequester our nutrients and also to do things in terms of helping us better um, reach nutrients that are in the soil. So this would be an example of one of our cover crop mixes. Here would be another. We're trying to catch nit nitrogen from the air. I, a <coughs> I asked Cesar a question the other night, what's the parts per million of nitrogen in the atmosphere? And I'll let you guys contemplate that for a while and we'll get back to it. But here we're catching nitrogen to help the wheat stubble decompose and turn into organic matter. Here we're adding carbon to a system where it's too low in carbon, and we're going to graze this in a lot of cases. And it really helps to have a short guy that works with you so you can have him stand in the fields to take photos. But we call this catch and release nutrients. In the U.S., some of the people who fish will catch a fish and just release it. They won't eat it. So this is kind of the same principle. We're going to catch those nutrients before they get away, and then we're going to release them to our crop when the time comes. The other thing that happens is if you look at this root system of one of our cover crops, that is covered with hyphae of, 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 of penicillium, which is a fungi that helps to solubilize phosphorus from the soil. So we can run really low phosphor soil tests but because we have the phenicillium there and we have mycorrhizae there, we don't get phosphorus responses. So we only add what we sell. We don't have to get luxuriant in how much phosphorus we need. <clears throat> the other thing that mycorrhizae can do is they can help transfer nitrogen from legumes to non-legumes. This is a photo of this is a photo of a cornfield that had no nitrogen fertilizer in it. And then we put some soybeans right beside that. We had soybeans in between the corn rows. And the soybeans fed their nitrogen to the corn plant in exchange for the carbon from, <coughs> from the corn. 
and the mycorrhizae mediate that exchange. We grow, we're trying to grow alfalfa in association with a continuous irrigated cornfield. We don't think continuous corn is a great answer, but that's one of the things we're doing for scientific reasons. But we're trying to find a way that we can have the alfalfa actually feed its nitrogen directly to the corn. And when we have these cover crops, we think that they should be grazed in a lot of cases, especially in our cold environment. Here you have <coughs> soil biology that goes year round. In northern climates, our soil biology stops in the winter time, and I'll show you that tomorrow because I have a photo of Gersu, Gersan at, <coughs> at our, our place when it was 27 degrees below zero Celsius. So there's no soil biology happening at that point. But the rumen of a cow carries on the soil biology when the ground is frozen, so it extends our growing season. Most nitrogen in feed that is hauled to a feedlot does not make it back to the field. Most nitrogen in feed consumed in the field remains there. There's a lot of data on that. So we're working real hard on things like bale grazing systems where they, they do bale some forage and they put it at the top of the hill where the soil has been eroded. So the livestock will eat the bales on the top of the hill and defecate there. And so they're fertilizing the top of the hill. Um, grain and graze is a system out of Australia where they're growing perennial and annuals at the same time. Our favorite one is a self-propelled grazing cell where we're, we're in the process of making a grazing pin or paddock that is self-propelled that you can call on your cell phone and move your cattle without having to go out there. Uh, <clears throat> I know you think it's too cold for cows to be out, but cows not only have legs, they have hairy coats. So they do just fine out in, out in the field in the wintertime, and this is swath grazed things. And then they leave the fertilizer out there. Now they're not smart enough yet to wait until this guy has done soil testing to know where exactly they should be applying the nutrient. If you could know only one thing about a soil, what would you want to know? Organic matter. If you take residue from the field, you not only take nitrogen. If you have a four and a half ton per acre wheat crop or half of a nine ton per acre per hectare corn crop, and if you take that residue off, you take off 56, pound, 56 kilograms per hectare of nitrogen, but you take off three and a half tons of carbon. Carbon is a limiting nutrient in the soil, and carbon is a limiting nutrient in our atmosphere. A small amount of organic matter by weight has a big impact on pore space because it only weighs one-fifth as much as the same volume of soil. So what that organ organic matter does is it tends to puff the soil up, reduce your organic matter, and allows more water to be held there. Within all texture groups, as organic matter increased from 1% to 3%, the available water holding capacity doubles. And if we can get up to 4%, then it, the organic matter is associated with 60% of the total available water holding capacity. Most of the guys that I started working with when they were irrigators no longer, no longer irrigate. The cost is too high. They make way more money. But now they've got soils that have been restored from the fact that they, they degraded them really badly doing wheat and summer fallow. Here's a long-term rotation study of ours where we have a rotation. This is uh, Trigo Inverno, winter wheat, uh, in a rotation that's half low residue crops. This is Trigo Inverno in the rotation that's two-thirds high residue crops in a, in, a, in a dry year. If you look at it from the top, you can see the bright red is in the higher residue and the, the really dull red at the arrow is in the low residue. Both of these fields were planted into Arvika. Both of those Arvika fields followed maize. So there's no difference in terms of rotational effect. What it is is the long-term 
organic matter effect because in the low residue rotation we throw in an extra soybean. And so we have half, 50%. And in fact, this wheat's not as good as the wheat that we grow where we have 80% high residue. If you look at the differences in yield in the dry year of 2006 when we had 201 millimeters of precipitation from the time the Arvika were harvested until the Trigo Inverno was harvested. Or in 2002 where, it, where we had 162 millimeters. We doubled the yield from basically two up to four tons per hectare. In a good year when we had 600 millimeters in that one year period of time, it, it still almost doubled yields, but now it started at four tons and went up over six tons. Organic matter makes a huge difference. This is an old photo of my three chicas who happen to be about the same age as Cesar's. Mine have blondy hair and blue eyes and his have dark eyes and dark hair. Uh, but other than that, they're all really nice girls and they're about the same age and they're, mine are all in college now. But that photo shows the root system of a prairie grass in North America. The root system of the pampa grass, would, the grass that was on the pampa would be similar and probably go deeper. When you grow a soybean, you're not even close to matching what was going on there before. Soil organic matter changes that associated with residue removal, if you're going to take re residue off, you need to compare that to native systems or to improve no-till systems, not degrading conventional till systems. What they do in the U.S. is they say, well, I can take off a ton or two tons of organic matter and not hurt the soil as compared to conventional till cor corn soybean. If they do continuous corn, they can take off a ton or two and it's as good as doing conventional till corn soybean. Who cares? Remember when I say if you make a profit by degrading the soil, it doesn't count. The residue can be cycled by use of grazing animals if we do it right. If they're properly designed, I think it has to be high intensity and short duration. And as long as we keep full residue cover. Now people talk about damage that livestock cause to the soils. When you have soils that have good soil structure and living roots, like a pasture, we don't worry so much about damage. So if we get damage from the livestock, it's not the livestock's fault. It's the idiot who's controlling them. Okay? Making friends today, right? Ecosystems are limited by the carbon cycle. The building and deconstruction, the energy, the rearranging of carbon compounds is the basis of all that happens in an ecosystem. <clears throat> an ecosystem, our, our atmosphere has about 280 to 350, depending on the time of year, parts per million of carbon. What, per, what part per million of nitrogen do we have? 800,000, 80% nitrogen, 800,000 parts per million nitrogen. The limiting factor is carbon and how well we manage the carbon and how well we use plants to harvest the energy from the sun. How much sunlight strikes green leaves and this energy flow, part of the ecosystem, makes food for the ecosystem? How much falls on dead vegetation or bare ground? The energy you use, remember I said 80% was outside energy. But is the energy you use constant or finite? Sunlight is constant. It's going to be there next year and next year and next year. Diesel fuel, crude oil is limited. Is it benign or is it potentially damaging? Sunlight versus diesel fuel. So we need to be harvesting. What's happening is we 
We have our ecosystems functioning so poorly that we have to throw energy into them to make them function instead of harvesting the energy that we could get from the sun. Your money and you, human capital, is it in, internal or external? Do you hire things done all the time or are you letting your plants and animals do the work for you? Well, your use of money build infrastructure, like a once only expense. Better soils and improved infrastructure are, are improved infrastructure. Building better soils makes you money down the road. It's like a win. People are so afraid that they're going to put money into something that they, they, into building organic matter by planting cover crops or something like that. That's an investment. Is the use consumptive? Internal combustion engines. A few, a month or so ago, I was at Winnipeg at a, at a, uh, the World Congress of Conservation Agriculture, and people were talking about giving people in third world two-wheel tractors. Well, if you give them two-wheel tractors, then they have to start buying fuel and tires and repairs and find people to repair it and whatever. It would it not be better to figure out a way that they could farm without tractors and also without animal traction? Is the use addictive of your money? Nitrogen fertilizers are addictive. Herbicides are addictive. A session on, some of the session on resistant weeds this morning should have taught us that. Francisco taught us that maybe you can do it without that. Tillage is addictive. Irrigation is addictive. Once you have it, you can't shut it off. You've got too much invested. You can't walk away from it. GMO traits are addictive. I'm not saying they're bad, but they're addictive. If you're using them, you can't stop using them necessarily without doing something totally different. If you farm 100,000 hectares using big tractors, purchase nitrogen, custom application of crop production products, custom combines, and sell all the grain directly to the port, what category do you fall under? Do many species have fairly stable populations of all ages, or does a population of just a few species fluctuate wildly? Weeds and diseases, my answer to the, to the resistant weed issue. Weeds and diseases are nature's way of adding diversity to a system that lacks it. Just focus on that statement. We intentionally developed pursuit resistant weeds pivot resistant weeds very early on just to prove that resistance would happen because the company at that time didn't think it would happen. And then we got rid of them. And we now use that product again. It's not a problem. Nature's efforts to add diversity do, like Francisco said this morning, by adding Diversity, nature's efforts to add that diversity can be countered by adding beneficial diversity of your own. This is a crop rotation study, two crop rotation studies, and I didn't count the weeds, Randy Anderson did from USDARS, but I, my, a colleague of mine and I ran parallel, somewhat parallel crop rotation studies. I did mine strictly low disturbance no-till. He did his with direct seeding like they do in Australia with, with uh, high disturbance seeders. And he used that only one year in the wheat year. He used low disturbance in the other year. It, after 10 years, we planted the fields. Big, these are big fields. We planted them uniformly to spring wheat. And he came out and counted all the weeds that came up, which is interesting. In the tilled side or the one with disturbance and a two-way rotation, he had 225 weeds in the no-till site we had 94 both of us per square meter both both of us are failing <clears throat> in the four crop rotation he still had 44 I had seven per square meter with no herbicides just planting a crop a week the best Weed control is a good crop canopy. We tried to keep last year's crop canopy in place until this year's crop canopy can form, or we'll put in a cover crop to increase the crop canopy. 
if I had <coughs> uh, resistant amaranth in Missouri, I'd plant winter canola as a crop. It wouldn't have a chance. There's a wheat field with no herbicides and a big skip. Even though we don't have a canopy, if you do it well enough, you're okay. Tillage, disturbance, and poor rotation gave 225 weeds per square meter. No-till and good rotation, seven. That's 97% weed control. Go ask the guys out there if they're guaranteed you 97% weed control. Okay. Some experts in the U.S. are recommending tillage to deal with resistant weeds. And one of them is even say what you got to do is vary your depth of tillage. Tillage to bury weeds was mentioned this morning. But when they're buried, they don't die. They come back as soon as you dig them back up again. So if you ran a vertical tillage machine through there and those buried weeds got kicked back to the surface, they would start growing all over again. If tillage was so good at eliminating weeds, all the weeds in the U.S. and Europe should be gone by now. I'll wait for the translator to catch up. <laughs> Mother Nature's an opportunist. If you have a problem, you have provided the opportunity somewhere in your system, and all you got to do is figure out how to change the system. Concentrating having the soil moist during the dry part of the year. So often we want the soil dry during the wet part of the year so we can get planted early. And as a consequence, we end up being dry during the dry part of the year. Concentrate on having soil cool during the hot part of the year. Often, we don't do that. If we have it bare, that's 107 degree Fahrenheit soil temperature, which is 43 degrees Celsius versus 33 degrees Celsius under the canopy, that was in the same field, just literally meters apart from each other. Instead of just focusing on having the soil warm during the cool part of the year so your crop can get up going well, make sure you keep it so it's cool, so the roots can function and the soil microbiology can function during that hot part of the year. Most agrarian societies in recorded history have lasted 500 years or less. We now have a much enhanced capability to cause destruction. Are we going to last 500 years? We've only been here in the Western Hemisphere with agriculture for 150 years. And a lot of that in, Ar in Argentina was done with grazing, with very little farming. When President John Kennedy had his speech on the Apollo missions, he concluded by saying, we do these things not because they are easy. We do these things because they are hard, but they must be done. 1996, I visited. I visited before that. I visited <clears throat> once before that. This is my second trip to Argentina, and Caesar can tell you where this is, but <clears throat> this field it was in pastures that rotated from pastures to farming. And on the left was a cover crop, if I remember right, of vetch and black oats. And on the right, no cover crop. And I had my friend hold some soil so I could take a photo, so I could show the people in the United States what a wonderful job of managing the soils the farmers in Argentina were doing with their pastures and and their perennial sequences going back into diverse rotations with cover crops. Now this is what the soil in Argentina looks like. We have to do these things not because they're easy, but because they're hard, but we have to do them. Is this what you want to turn over to your grandchildren? The best time to have started this new way of approaching problems was 20 years ago when we took those pictures. The second best time to start is today. Lack of knowledge is, not the, is, a, is a problem. We know, we know we don't know as much as we should about soil micro, microorganisms. 
because we didn't have them very much when we did lots of tillage, and we haven't learned what we should learn about them. But lack of knowledge is a problem, but lack of commitment to this idea that we're just going to quit doing this silliness and get down to the business of being sustainable, that's the big problem. Incremental thinking and incremental research will not be sufficient to address present-day issues. We just need to do it differently. You do not cross a chasm in two steps. Right? Can't take little baby steps when you're going across a chasm. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Dwayne. Vamos a empezar a recibir algunas preguntas para el doctor Beck. Bueno, ahí está. La primera dice, ¿cómo se puede manejar el problema de la lenta mineralización de rastrojos en sistemas de labranza cero en zonas de bajas temperaturas? Well, we use, we use starter, starter nitrogen on all of our corn. We will put 60 kilograms per hectare on our irrigated corn, uh, and we'll probably never go underneath uh, about 30 kilograms per hectare, and we'll place that 7.5 centimeters to the side of the corn row and at the depth of the, of the corn seed. And, and that gives us our early nitrogen that we need on the corn. We have some sulfur in with that. We'll have about one-tenth as many kilograms of sulfur per hectare in that mix as we have nitrogen. And, and that will very, very consistently give us a huge, a huge pop. When you really want your mineralization to take place is late. If it takes place early and you get a big rain, it's going to leach. So you don't want mineralization taking place early. It's a good thing for it to take place later because that's when the corn really needs the nitrogen is later. And if you have it all there early, then you have a problem. We do a similar thing on our wheat, but, but with wheat we'll place it a little further away because we don't want it to get it quite as early because it'll tiller too much. So we'll, we actually put that, that uh, oh, half again or twice as far away from the right in between the two rows, two lines of wheat. It's happy hour. Huh? I said it's happy hour. They're not... They're <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Otra pregunta tenemos para el Dr. Beck. Dice, a futuro, ¿no cree que las labranzas se harán con tractores eléctricos y no con combustibles fósiles? Well, I, I don't. I don't care if the the energy and the machinery to do tillage was free. Uh, I wouldn't do it anyway. It's too dang destructive to the to the soil, and it's too destructive to to the way water and, and the microorganisms work. So the the cost of the tillage is not the issue. That's kind of what I was pointing out. The the cost of the tillage, the seeding, tillage, and harvest in Minnesota is not a very high cost. If in, in relative to the price of corn and how much corn they're producing, that's not the bad thing. But uh, what's happening is they're they're ruining their soils. If they if you continue to do if Minnesota continues to do what they're doing, they'll have nothing left in in a hundred years. They're not going to make six hundred or five hundred years. So the the cost of doing the tillage is not the issue. But if you had electric tractors, you still got to get the energy from somewhere. Uh, this little thing we've done with saying we're going to be fossil fuel neutral by 2026, I mean, that includes the energy we get from electricity from, from off-site because that's produced using coal, a lot of it. So we're going to offset all that electricity that we, we end up buying. So it's uh, basically we're going to, we're going to, but you find out real quickly where you're, where your costs are in terms of energy and, and fuel. One of the really interesting things, fuel for doing tillage wasn't, wasn't that costly even 
I haven't done it in 30 years, but it's just not that costly. And when we look at the, the, the diesel type fuel that we use now compared to what would have happened on that farm before we started no-till and diverse rotations, and I've done that calculation, we actually use more diesel fuel now than they would have used then. And the reason we do is we have to haul the crop to market, and we grow so much more stuff, and we have to harvest so much more stuff. So, so we have more energy going into the combine, and we have more energy going into the trucks that haul things to the, to the market, to, the, to basically not quite as far as you guys go to the port, but we go a long ways. So <clears throat> that, that cost, because of our higher, higher productivity, is, is a major cost for us. But as soon as we start reintegrating the livestock, then that cost goes way down because if you, you can call it, haul a cow much cheaper, you can call all, all the grain that goes into it. Tenemos otra pregunta. Dr. Wayne dice, ¿cuánta comunicación tienen ustedes con el gobierno de Estados Unidos? ¿Qué tan importante es el apoyo estatal para el sistema que plantea? Well, you can come tomorrow and see what they think of my system, but um, because we're going to address some of that tomorrow. But the the government really doesn't care. I mean, now there's some of the some of the agencies are starting to catch on, but in in the beginning, um, they 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 don't really care. I mean, that's they, that's a political system, just like it is here. The government doesn't really care that much whether it's sustainable or not sustainable. They just want to keep a certain number of voters happy. Uh, locally, we have quite a bit of support now because we have the producers that like what we're doing and we have a lot of support from them and politically that's given us quite a bit of, of at least they say they like what we're doing. I think that could change in a minute. So. <laughs> <laughs> it, politicians don't change. They just change their language is all from Spanish to English to German <laughs> to Russian. Whatever. Hubo muchos políticos esta mañana, ¿eh? Le recuerdo, doctor. Eh, ¿Tenemos más preguntas? <risa> sí, es cierto. Eh, ¿No tenemos más preguntas? A ver. Bueno, me parece que llegó el momento del happy que... hour, doctor Beck. Muchísimas gracias otra vez. Agradecemos al doctor Beck. Thank you very much.